But uh, welcome to this uh, panel. Um, you know, I am really honored, you know, to be able to moderate this August panel in November. Okay, um, you know, a lot of different perspectives. Um, you know, it's going to be a lot of fun. Okay, uh, I just just before I get started, I want to get an idea of uh, you know, kind of the background. Uh, I think one of the questions that I wanted to ask was already asked, right? Uh, but the next question I wanted to ask was, how many of you? Consider yourself as kind of application developers, enterprise developers, you know? How many of you are developers, per se, who have written, I don't know, uh, thousands of lines of code of Java, Python, whatever the favorite language may be? Okay. Uh, how many of you have never done any de development and will never do development, you know, will do development across your dead body or something like that, right? You know, how many of you are in the... Okay, nobody. Okay, that's good. Um, so what, what we are here to talk about is, uh, you know, should, you know, I, I, I purposely wanted to keep this panel a little bit controversial, and in fact, today morning when we had, uh, you know, kind of a T to T T to talk about the panel, you know, we said uh, there are really no rules, okay? So if they fight, you know, it's just because they really disagree on it and they're passionate about OpenStack succeeding, okay? Uh, the only thing I said was, if you can, let's try to avoid some bloodshed, okay? Um, but really, in the end, you know, it's your panel. Uh, hopefully, you'll ask some thought-provoking questions and, uh, you know, keep the panel interesting. Um, I am the guy who adds least value, so I'm going to keep the introduction to, um, you know, as minimal as possible. Uh, I know this is really early days of OpenStack. You know, we just celebrated the third uh, birthday, right? Um, and, and really, if you think about how the app economy, the API economy, and how contributed uh, you know, to the society in general, if you will, uh, I think developers are, are kind of in this unique position where they can, um, you know, influence the growth of pretty much any system, right, or the growth of any ecosystem. Uh, and when I mean developers, you know, I need to draw the distinction. It's not the OpenStack developers who, you know, whose life and blood is OpenStack, right? This is developers who are building on top of the OpenStack. Uh, one of the things when I attended the Portland Summit was I thought that, you know, it could be either as part of the evolution, but, you know, or, or for whatever reason, um, I, I didn't find OpenStack as compelling uh, from a purely developer perspective, from a purely application developer perspective, okay? Um, and like I said, it's, it could be part of the evolution. You know, there are some really cool things happening in Havana uh, that uh, obviously is going to sway, uh, but, but I think, you know, I think we have turned the corner. Uh, I think application developers, uh, you know, are going to influence OpenStack. And if you have to grow from hundreds of thousands to millions, uh, I think we have to have the application developer in there, okay? Um, one of the things that I strongly, rec you know, and, and I strongly talk about this is uh, a seminal paper in 1985 by Michael, Michael Stonebreaker. Uh, how many of you have read this paper by Michael Stonebreaker? Um, you know, this was written in 85, where he talked about share nothing or shard everything, okay? And in fact, OpenStack designed tenets. Uh, how many of you knew that there was an OpenStack design tenets? You know, any, yeah, okay, cool. Um, if, you, if you go read it, you know, it's pretty cool. Um, and I think the reason why I bring that up is, um, as an application developer, OpenStack is definitely something that's of interest. Uh, you know, if you want to do high availability, you want to do scalability, if you want to do performance, um, which is really not the traditional strength of a core developer, you know, you'd rather the infrastructure do it for you, right? So I think, I think it, it makes a lot of sense to use OpenStack in this context. Okay, and having said that, I think I've already exceeded my time here, okay? So my name is Raghavan Srinivas. I go by Rags. I work for Rackspace. I work as a solutions architect. And one of my uh, questions that keeps me up in the night is, should developers really care about infrastructure as a service? Okay, and I will move on to the next speaker who is going to introduce himself, Chris Ferris from IBM, a uh, couple of minutes. Sure. Hi, I'm Chris Ferris. I'm an IBM Distinguished Engineer and CTO for Cloud Interoperability, which means that I have uh, overall technical responsibility for all the open source and open standards work we do relative to cloud, including OpenStack, Cloud Foundry, and a, a bunch of other stuff, Oasis Tosca, and so forth. Um, my, my, my primary interest is around interoperability. That's 
that's why I took the title that I did. Um, you know, a lot of what we do is really about, uh, it, w whether it's in the context of open standards or open source, is really about interoperability and portability. So that's sort of my, that's, that's, that's my position and I'm sticking with it. All right, sounds good. Moving one over, that's Diane Mueller. And she's from Red Hat and uh, Diane, you got two minutes. All right, well thank you. Um, so I'm Diane Mueller, I am with the OpenShift team, uh, which is a platform as a service that's sponsored by Red Hat and it's an open source project. And I'm the community manager for that and a cloud evangelist. Uh, and some people would call me a bit of a pause queen. Um, so I, I will put a few words in for a platform as a service here. But one of the, the burning things for me, I think, as um, my Twitter handle will, will show, I'm a Python developer and an application developer at heart. And for me, what's happened with the rise of um, infrastructure as a service, and especially with the OpenStack world, has been the, the rise of the developer's involvement in the computing resources and the, the um, helping to build the requirements for those computing resources and having a, a say in how the cloud that we get to build and that we get to deploy our applications is built. And I think one of the um, amazing things that's happening here at the OpenStack Summit that I'm very happy to be part of is a lot of the cross collaboration across um, infrastructure as a service, the platform as a service. You'll see, um, I'm sure you'll be talking about some of the stuff that's happening at Rackspace with the Solemn and with Docker. But one of the things that's really key, I think, to where we're going as a infrastructure as a service offering um, that is OpenStack is that we're being able to take the developers' use cases, whether they're just web framework-based ones or enterprise application developers who are trying to deploy very complex applications and make those use cases work within the framework of that OpenStack cloud. And what we're seeing, I think, now is we've, we saw initially the rise of the public cloud with AWS and Azure and Google App Engine um, as being something that, that application developers like myself jumped on board with but now we're seeing people take that technology, that elastic compute technology, and bring it into the enterprise. So I think now what you're getting is the enterprise use cases are starting to rise up for infra infrastructure as a service, and that's what's making um, things really happen across communities. Okay. okay, moving on, we have Lou Tucker from Cisco. Yeah, hi everyone. Two minutes. Okay, I'm Lou Tucker, CTO Cloud Computing at Cisco. And I guess one of the comments I'd just like to make is that we sometimes people pose this as IAS versus PaaS. And I think none of us on the panel would probably think that that's an or, it's an and. And that's because when you're developing new applications, you actually are building on top of services. And I also think sometimes we got it wrong. It's really services as a platform. That's what Amazon really perfected, I think, in terms of, of EC2 and S3 and SQS it made the developer's life so much easier. They didn't have to worry about how are they going to store enormous amounts of data when they've got S3, or in OpenStack we've got Swift and Ceph. So I think that cloud, compute, cloud platforms right now have absolutely proven it's the fastest way to develop and to deploy an application. You don't have to call up your IT guy to try to you know, rack and stack a bunch of servers for something new that you want to do. If you're running it even inside of a private cloud and an application developer in a private cloud, it's so much easier. And that's why we're seeing the, the hundreds of thousands of applications that are running on top of AWS today. And then we're seeing that now happening as OpenStack is now moving into a wide variety of markets. I mean, I'm seeing it going into financial services, going into telcos, going into, so it's not just for the cloud providers, but everybody's recognizing in the data center, there's this new layer. It's called the cloud platform layer. And that's what application developers are targeting today. All right, last but not the least, we come back to Adrian Arto from Rackspace. And, um, you know, he's going to talk about what he likes about OpenStack. Hi, I'm Adrian. I'm a uh, principal architect at Rackspace. And I'm currently leading a software development effort called Solum in conjunction with uh, about nine or ten other companies including Red Hat, Canonical, uh, Ubuntu, oh, I'll miss them all, eBay, Cumulogic, CloudSoft. Um, what we're trying to do is make the cloud easier to use for developers. 
and specifically make OpenStack clouds easier to use for developers and to make applications more portable between clouds. And what we recognize is um, when people talk about platform as a service, that the systems that exist today for platform as a service are overlapping more and more with what OpenStack is trying to do. And if you look at what's happened recently uh, with respect to technology, uh, we have better uh, operating system container technology than we did before. That's really gotten to a point now where it's stable and, and starting to become more prolific. We've got uh, more and more enterprises trying to do agile development, and we've got this insatiable desire for uh, cloud technology. And so we have this gap in the OpenStack ecosystem where we want to fill how do we make the cloud easy for developers to make new cloud applications, not just to take existing applications and run them on the cloud. And so that's where we're focusing. All right. I have a last slide, and that, you know, this is it with respect to slides. This is really your panel. Okay, so whatever questions you ask is fair game. Okay, yeah. you know, make the panelists squirm in the seats a little bit. Okay, so ask them the tough questions. Um, analyze what you hear from them and, and just act on it. So hopefully as a community, we can, we can contribute back. You know, it's not always that you have to contribute code you know, to contribute to the community. You can do something. Um, you attend the sessions in the track, apps on OpenStack. Um, you know, uh, it's kind of like, I don't know, orange color or something, right? Um, you know, uh, this happens to be the apps on OpenStack uh, track. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there are a number of other sessions interspersed there. Uh, I know Lou is talking on, uh, you know, about networks and how they make a impact on application. That's uh, tomorrow at 12.05. Um, OpenStack community welcomes developer in all languages. Everett Toes, uh, you know, he's going to be talking about JClouds and a bunch of other things. Um, on Friday, we have putting the pass in OpenStack in heat, right? And, and there are a whole bunch of other um, sessions that I strongly recommend you go. Um, you know, one of the things that Rackspace firmly believes are in core, core develop, uh, I mean, one of the core values, uh, you know, is that it's full disclosure, okay? So in full disclosure, I have to say that, you know, some of us have worked at Sun before. Right, Lou worked at Sun, Chris worked at Sun, and I myself worked at Sun, okay? We know how that movie kind of ended, so it's not what we are talking about, right? We are talking about a different thing, but there are a lot of parallels that you can draw from that to this. Uh, and, and, and hopefully, um, you know, you make this panel interesting. So who wants to start off with questions? Questions, yes, go ahead. Uh, can we get a mic, please? Please hold off if you, if you can. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on a second. I, I think they may be recording. Recorded, so. Yeah, yeah, bring, yeah. So just hold on one second if you can yeah. be patient. Maybe I can use this mic if you don't mind. Do we have an extra mic? Actually, you know, while we're waiting, it just, you know, when you mentioned Sun, I remember one of the things that we learned there as part of the early Java days was that when you create a new platform layer, it's classic computer science, you create innovation above and below the platform. And so that's why we're seeing heat and everything else, I think, start to arise above sort of the core platform. And we're seeing software-defined networking and programmable infrastructure and everything else happening below it. So I think that's something, one of the parallels, I think, from, from the past Absolutely. to learn from. Question. Question. Yeah, actually, uh, I just want to uh, kind of qualify a little bit, actually. Myself as a developer, and I think there's uh, IAAS and PAAS, to me, IAAS doesn't really, it's irrelevant to me. But the PAAS is starting, it does, because that have a platform which I need to worry about. So I want to know what your opinion on that, and because I think uh, you guys asked earlier, right, it seems like a developer, maybe some of them are irrelevant. So I, I want to see, you know, where I am. Okay, Thanks. I have my own opinions, but I'm not going to talk about that. Um, yeah, let's start with Diane. Ladies first. So, so one of the things that I always say about um, someone has a, a cloud initiative, and they, if they only focus on the IAS level, then um, when they get to the end of that project, they've, in, they've built a private cloud in-house, in and they've, they put their infrastructure, and they have all their compute resources, and then they go to talk to the developers, and the developers, like you, myself included, um, are looking for... Uh, the platform is a service and it's not there. And so I think what we're seeing now is, in, in my humble opinion, um, probably not my employers completely yet, but is the convergence of 
uh, platform as a service and infrastructure as a service. So in order to really make infrastructure as a service um, useful, you need things like heat and the orchestration tools and the platform as a service um, brokering functionality so that you don't have to build and orchestrate your own LAMP stack and scale it and auto scale it. And that's really what the PaaS functionality is. And some of the technology that's coming out with Heat and Docker and Solem, if I say it right, Solem, Solem, um, Solem, is really about the next uh, generation of platform as a service. And that's what's being built and talked about here at the OpenStack Summit this time around is we're getting the new building blocks for building PaaS functionality on top of OpenStack. And that's what makes OpenStack really useful to developers. Okay, Chris, uh, you want to go? Or, uh, anybody wants to add? Or do all I just want to make sure we don't over-rotate on this because I think it's one of the tools. The developers use our tools. And what we are getting with the, the sort of new PaaS um, methodologies and everything else actually is a better way to describe complex applications and their interactions, so I very much like that. But it's not, you still have sort of the, the need for a very large scale key value store. You need have the need for something which will dynamically provision virtual machines or Linux containers for you. So these things are all become, I think, we are seeing that merger. It's all the services. These, if we start thinking what we've really made the shift to is to services. We're no longer talking about, um, you know, exactly, you know, a physical host that you have to now make sure the BIOS are set correctly and wire up correctly. You have an abstraction that you can deal with, which is, and you're contacting a provisioning service, a compute service. And we shouldn't forget the fact that there are hundreds of thousands of applications that have been built on IAS. Look at Amazon today. Uh, Netflix built their own orchestration layers themselves. So I think that we're, you know, the, the constant evolution of tooling and everything else is, is great, and that's what we really need to see. But I think, in fact, what you'll find, you'll use a variety of tools, and you will use the tools that are most appropriate for you. And if you fit into actually, you know, you remember like in Heroku, I was using Heroku for a while. I mean, that, that sort of model, that's great. I loved Ruby on Rails. That was another environment, a framework that could, I could rapidly deploy an application. But I then was constrained when I needed to actually scale out to a certain dimension. So these are tools, and we should use them all and really understand the capabilities of each. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's right. And, and I think, you know, there's, so there's room for a lot of different, uh, if you will, approaches to addressing how to deliver capability that the application developer will interact with. Them. So, But that's, again, you're not, that, that's not for an application developer. That's something that's necessary, and again, that's where we have orchestration tools and so forth that allow us to stand up those complex workloads. So you, you need this range of capabilities. So I don't think that there's ever going to be one answer. It's like you said, Lou, it's going to be, there's going to be a, a collection of, of tools that we can bring to bear, you know, whether it's Netflix OSS or whatever, um, to deliver the value that we're looking for. 
in our particular use of OpenStack. Okay. So I'm going to answer the question with a question. How many in the audience are on a DevOps team where you operate and develop the software? Can you raise your hand for a minute? Okay, this is still a growing trend. So I'd say maybe I got 10 hands. Um, as you see more and more DevOps, yeah. this question starts to become more and more relevant. Okay, when you have pure application developers, they really only care about having a place to run their application and not worrying about infrastructure. Those are kind of their key interests. But once you start going down the DevOps track, you start to care about the infrastructure more and more. And you start to care about automating things. You start to care about things like test gates. You start to care about continuous integration, continuous deployment. And if you care about that stuff, then you don't really want a separation of concerns between platforms and infrastructure. You would like something more blurred and more general purpose so that you can fit exactly what you need as a DevOps engineer to get what you need from it. So I'd say where we are today, you're right, you probably might just want to focus on pass. But where we're headed and where I believe we will be in a matter of years is at a point where we don't really draw a distinction between the two. They're really one and the same. All right, now that we have beaten the IAS versus PAS to death, uh, let's go to over there. So you're all talking about tools for developers. Some, are, some of the most fundamental tools we can provide to developers are software development toolkits. You know, these things written in specific programming languages that talk to the OpenStack API. And then others can build more complex tools on top of those, but you really need that, that fundamental layer there. So my question is, how do we get OpenStack contributing companies contributing to these open source SDKs out in the wild? Uh, like for example, Fog. Chef is dependent on Fog. Puppet is dependent on Fog for spinning up resources on OpenStack clouds. How do we get the Cisco's, the IBM's, the Red Hat's contributing to the wider tool ecosystem in OpenStack? We, we do. Oh, All so of them this do. Is the, this is the SDK question, and uh, who, who wants to take a stab? Um, I'll answer it is from Rackspace right. perspective. Yeah, Rackspace contributes to Fog. We also have our own SDK that suits our own, our own narrow interests. Um, but they absolutely do. And the reason why you don't see huge amounts of, of contribution to those things is because they don't, they're, they're done. They're, they're finished. They're not, there's just not a lot of action happening in Fog right now. You create new resource types, right? And you get new, new abstractions, but Fog is a finished product. Uh, I would disagree. I mean, there's constantly new APIs coming up in OpenStack, so you constantly need to, and there's changes as well, so you need to add and maintain that code and fog. Yep. That's happening. Right. All right, moving down. Red Hat, Dan, you, you want to talk? I think I, you, you covered it. Okay. I think it's out, it's out How about there. It's happening. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I, one, one thing I would just sort of say uh, OpenStack is not going to cover all of software. It should not. We have to, you know, there's a lot of other very, you know, vibrant open source projects that we're looking to make sure work well with OpenStack and are available. And we want to also make sure there's commercial software opportunities for the companies that are doing it. I think your question actually gets to a deeper point. I mean, if you, you know, IDEs, you know, something that is really integrated on your desktop deployment on top of a cloud. And that's where I see a lot of the past work integrating back into the developers you know, desktop so that they can, with containers and things like that, we can start to do a lot more of these things. So I think you're going to see it. But it won't necessarily be an OpenStack project. What we want to make sure is that these things all work with OpenStack because otherwise OpenStack just grows sort of uncontrollably. And we have, we really want to keep the focus on OpenStack on doing the things that it's really set out to do better and better and better. Um, and leaving opportunity and working with other communities to get a lot of the tool, tool sets around it as well. So I, I still see that look on your face. So yeah, I'm just I'm I'm just a bit concerned in in the OpenStack community of kind of the obsession around uh, commits to open GitHub.com/slash OpenStack. When yes, all that all that's super important, but OpenStack's to a point where you know we we need to provide that fundamental just as AWS provides their we SDKs. To we contribute yeah. to we contribute. You know, I think you're seeing. Cut, you're, 
contributions that yeah. have I mean, to be at that domain. Yeah, I, I think. Same thing. We contribute to Chef. We contribute to the Java SDK. I mean, there are a number of things that IBM is doing that maybe is not as visible. We don't, yeah. you know, talk about it in the context of what we're doing in OpenStack. And yes, in the broader in the broader context, I mean, we're all about OpenStack. We're, we're you know, uh, this is our strategy, right? from an IaaS perspective. So whatever we need to do to enable it for our customers, we're, we're contributing to. Yes, uh, so I would, I would just say like at Red Hat, there's over 100,000 open source projects that we participate in in some way. And, and um, there are IDEs that are integrated already with OpenShift um, and you know, a, as far as that That's matters, right. then, then that means it's running, you can deploy yeah. to OpenStack or AWS, or AWS or wherever you want from it. So it, re when, when we talk about um, participation in, in open source projects, I think that we're so spread over so many different projects that um, I, don't, I don't know exactly who's contributing to FOG from Red Hat, but they may even be in the room or here at the conference. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, moving on, next question. Yeah? Wow. So one question I might like to get right. back to. Okay, grab one. Yeah, you guys uh, talk about uh, from an applications developer's perspective, um, being able to more or less provide a structure to where uh, we can use any provider and be able to transport from provider to provider. How are you? How do you go about um, ensuring that when I write some code, that I can transport it and that it's that it's mobile? Is there any way? Is there like a tenant? that's out there that says that thou shalt follow this interface so that it makes it easy for me to transport my code? Okay. Uh, well, the there is a definition around open, so there are OpenStack APIs, uh, and we're having, and there's certification, and we're looking at, you know, applying the power of the brand uh, to ensure that we have interoperability between open, different OpenStack deployments, whether it's on a private cloud or at a service provider. Uh, and that, that's a lofty goal, though, because, you know, that takes time for everybody to sort of come up to the same release and everything else like that. And so perhaps, you know, on the, on the inspection side, on a tool, you might be able to, to develop some of that technology to find out whether your app could deploy. But I think one of the, one of the real tenets of OpenStack is we see the real va one of the real value propositions of OpenStack is that we hope to see hundreds and thousands to thousands of OpenStack clouds out there that are both you know, in-house, you know, a private cloud, and at service providers, and we want them all to have the ability, the developers, to move their applications freely from one to another, provided they have the right credentials and everything else. Right, that, that's exactly right. I mean, again, we're looking for that interoperability and portability across all these OpenStack clouds. And that, I think, you know, applies equally to the tooling yep. that gets applied in the context of OpenStack. And again, whether that tooling is developed as a project in OpenStack or attendant to OpenStack, if you will, like, you know, some of the StackForge stuff, or, you know, if it's happening, whether it's in OpenShift or Cloud Foundry or whatever, right? So um, uh, or, or Eclipse, for instance, if you have just a, an IDE, or, you know, we're working on, you know, things in Jazz Hub. I mean, the intention would be that you can interact directly with the underlying cloud, if you will. I mean, it shouldn't, shouldn't really matter whether it's an IaaS or a PaaS. So some of the work that's being done on Docker, and you'll, if you read up on that, the containerization approach that is now being adopted into OpenStack as a project, that's going to help a lot with the portability of your application across different OpenStack clouds and, and other clouds that adopt and support uh, the Docker uh, as, I, won't, I hate to say the word standard yet, yeah, but, um, but, I think, but I think what, it's an emerging um, area, and I think if you keep an eye on what's going on with Docker, you'll see that aiding along with the, the certification and keeping the brand. But OpenStack itself can be deployed in so many different ways um, that I think, and Randy Bias, who was on just before this, um, really uh, put, it, put it well in saying how OpenStack is it's not quite yet a system. It is a framework of components that people build clouds with, and trying to keep that to be a standard way that everybody could build on a private cloud, a public cloud, or a hybrid cloud applications that would port anywhere is uh, a lofty goal still. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Is this working? Um, what is the typical size of an OpenStack deployment that you see? Let's say the, the minimal one that you see, 10 servers or something like that, or one even? Go down to one on, on my laptop. <laughs> <laughs> Dev stack. Okay. Dev stack, of course. I, but seriously. I, I think the I, question was, what is the typical? You know, I mean, definitely the minimal is one, but the typical I mean, is If you can describe the various deployments right. that you saw, that would be helpful. Usually it's a couple racks. happened yet, but we did a survey of users, and there's some of the data in that which show it going up to, you know, the largest or, you know, in, in tens of thousands, um, a small number of those. I'm actually interested in a smaller uh, place. Small? Customers. Well, uh, we, I've got a whole open stack team, so we, you know, each developer sort of gets three blades. Um, so you can, you can do quite a lot with very small, but I think that the interesting aspect there is actually memory on these systems is growing quite a bit. And so on, on blades or, or rack mountables where you've got a lot of memory, you can run you know, hundreds of virtual machines. So you can do quite a bit with just a small you know, half rack cloud or whatever. It can be pretty substantial for companies just starting out. The number of nodes is usually proportional to the amount of storage in the network um, in, in a typical cloud. So if you've got a, a tremendous storage requirement, you're going to have a lot of nodes. It's going to be a lot of gear. Um, if you're using it mainly for virtualization, then you'll have fewer nodes. So you typically see one room, one room or less full of equipment. If you've got a huge storage requirement and you're trying to store a petabyte of data, you're going to have, you know, thousands of machines. Okay. Um, I, I do have another, another question. I'm not sure it's the right audience. Do you see Windows relevant at all? Meaning... Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. About half of what Rackspace sells are Windows. Okay. Next question. Yeah. Thank you. If, if we say that uh, an enterprise app developer is building like a, an app that's going to scale up really large and it's going to have lots of different types of nodes, yeah. what, what can we do to help people to understand the interactions between the decisions they make on the compute and the storage and yeah. the networking that, as they kind of try and get that all to work together across a large area? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think if, you, if I understand you right, you know, how do we make those decisions because OpenStack doesn't recommend you know, this many storage nodes, this many compute nodes, or whatever, right? You know, yeah. you, one thing that cloud computing does not eliminate is the need for good design. You do have to think about this. You have to incrementally roll out your functionality, test, observe the behavior of your system, and go forward. There, there's nothing's changed in that regard. That I've seen over the last 15, 20 years. Um, so I think what you're, you're getting to, though, what we could all benefit from as a community, I think, is much more sharing of examples and perf yeah. with real performance data, real scaling characteristics. Uh, I'm constantly on my team asking them to go and try and make those measurements, right, Shannon, and publish them the results, and I urge everybody in the community, because I think we'd all benefit from them. More reference architectures, uh, you know, things like that. Yeah. Uh, so real, I want real, I want real applications, yeah. and right. real performance, yeah. and how they designed it, and everything else. You want real benchmarking is what yeah. you want. Real have. benchmarking. Yeah. More, so, yeah. So, so more there, 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 there is that, but I, and, and again, it sort of, it gets to the, to the point that there's sort of, uh, maybe this is a little bit too black and white, but there are sort of the class of workloads that you know, it's the twenty percent of applications that matter to the business, frankly, really. You know, they are the ones that actually bring the money right. in, and those are the ones that the IT really needs to care about. And they want to babysit those, they want to optimize, op optimize those systems, you know, to be as performant as they possibly can be, uh, because they need to be, and, and, and they need to make sure that the damn things don't fall down, right? Absolutely, positively. And then there's the 80% of the applications that they run <laughs> that, frankly, are an annoyance to them, right? They aren't the ones that bring in the money, but they, they, they're necessary, right? And then, but do you have to invest all your resources to optimizing those things, right? Or is good enough good enough for most of them? And I think, you know, again, this is where there's an awful lot of experimentation going on that, you know, you take a look at something like 
Cloud Foundry, there's one way. I mean, the, the developer does not get involved in the architecture for how storage talks to networking. You know, talk, they don't know and they don't care and they don't want to know, frankly. You know, they just want to write their damn app. And I need database as a service. I need, you know, I need to be able to sort of suck stuff out of Twitter. You know, I, I want to have, you know, an analytics service, whatever it is. That's all they want to deal with. They don't want to deal with what was the architecture of the storage solution that got my data, you know, as quick as it possibly could to my application because it's not that important to them, right? And so, you know, I think you want to have this range of capabilities. And so there are going to be, th th there's going to be a need to tune your ERP system or whatever to, you know, to a fairly well. And then there's going to be a lot of the sort of the more systems of engagement style applications, the mobile social analytics kind of stuff that frankly, the developers don't want to know and they don't care. And, and, and we will get these things to scale horizontally and, and those other problems become less of an issue for, for the application developers. Yeah. All right. Actually, just Course scaling horizontally is a hard problem. It is. But and fortunately, what we have is that we're built on top of services that like a, I mentioned key value store or a message bus system or whatever, which has been designed by people who really understand what it means to scale. So the individual developer doesn't have to. Right. And that's another attribute I think of paths and everything else is that people are designing those things who are thinking a lot about the architecture and about the scaling properties of it. So the developer doesn't have to, they can care about their application. Really the question? The oh, the do you have a follow up? Yeah. Really the only thing the application developer cares about at the end is the cost of those compute resources for their application. And so managing that and having that um, work on the auto scaling of their application and making sure that they're getting the best um, bang for their buck is really um, what they, they care about the most. And as long as that, if that piece of the, the puzzle is, is taken care of by the platform as a service and their applications scale up and down successfully and they don't get charged for resources they're not using, they're usually happy. Yeah, I'm not sure if I agree with that because when I was an application developer, you know, I just used to spin up VMs and of course my manager would come back and worry about it. So, yeah. you know, so. but in any case, yeah, let's go back over there. Okay. Uh, somewhat of a different topic. Uh, one distinguishing characteristic of some enterprise applications is regulatory compliance. How do you see that um, playing out in OpenStack today and where do you see that going in the future? Excellent question. Regulatory compliance because, you know, like it or not, that's the problem that a lot of enterprises face. You know, HIPAA, you know, all those different standards. You know, how do we deal with it? It's, it's, a, it's a real question. I mean, I think that two things have to happen. One is that regulatory compliances have to be adapted for cloud computing. Because the idea of actually going in and doing an audit and things like that on Amazon doesn't work. Um, so we have to understand the intent of what we're trying to do with the, with the compliance. And then I also think, um, when we, like even when we take virtualized networking, that was a lot of what, you know, if you heard Martin's talk, I mean, he talked about, you're recreating it so that you can be compliant. So that if you demand isolation of this VLAN, well, a VLAN, would, I guess what it is, a virtual LAN, you're using shared wires, but compliant, regulatory, you know, people have understood that that's okay, there's isolation there. And that now when we're saying, now we're going to be using overlay tunnels instead and everything else, we have to be able to prove that there is that same kind of isolation so it can pass those regulatory compliance regula you know, requirements. Yeah, so there's, there's certainly the, can this be certified for FISMA, HIPAA, FedRAMP, whatever, right? Or, and I'm, I'm using U.S., but obviously there's other regimes that, that apply. Um, but typically those... Those regulations apply to a running solution. So it's, it's, it's not the software necessarily that you can certify. It's the actual environment into which you port it, right? And it's the operation of that particular environment that are... Change, change what, management and, right, and all of the exactly, auditing and right. everything else. So, uh, so, so very much to lose point. Some of the regulations that we have on the books today, you know, wherever they're coming from, are frankly they're somewhat dated, and they need to be sort of rethought again to get at the original intent, right? And to help the you know the government officials that are coming up with these things to better understand what this new world really means, and uh, and get at the core 
of what the you know the various requirements are today. So and that's a lot of what was some of the thinking that was going to FedRAMP uh, originally. It's not done, you know, by any stretch of the imagination. It's still got a ways to go. But, but it is being. But it's, it's better than. And it is being taken up, and it's very serious. Because right. I know I was on a um, advisory panel uh, with Vivek Kundram when he was saying there's cloud first, you know, policy in the White House, and that you know government agencies had to justify why they weren't going to take an application to a cloud and build a new data center. They were trying to stop the proliferation of a million data centers. And all of us in the industry have said, but regulatory compliance, you have, to, you have to address these things and you have to have those agencies update their thinking to accommodate that. And he said, by having a cloud first policy, that's the wedge we're gonna use. So I think that we're gonna see it, but we know those things take a long time, yeah, a very sure. long time constants. But I think, I think we'll get there. You know, and, and it's not just the sort of the, the governmental regulations and so forth that apply. It's also the corporate regulations. I know I'm running into this in IBM, probably not a surprise to anybody. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of process. And, you know, you have to go back to, again, you have to go back to the original intent. Why is that process there? What are we checking from a security perspective? And then let's actually work back, walk that back and understand what it is that we're doing in provisioning something based on cloud. Or... Uh, how we apply a context like DevOps when, you know, it's typically, you have to isolate who, you know, operations from the developers, right? And the developers, they can't get in there. No, 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 you, you can't do that. It says right here, you can't, you know. And, and so we have to change a lot of that, right, in order to, to yeah. get to you're where I think a lot of us are talking about. Continuous deployment, and you're deploying maybe 10 or 100 times a week, uh, and it takes two weeks to, to actually yeah. approve a change. Right. That's not going to work. That's not so going to fly. <laughs> those things have to change, but... It, look at the intent, and I think that we can still ach achieve the same kind of compliance that we want to with right. both the government and also corporate regulations. All right, I think we have time for one more question, you know, rather than end on the topic of compliance, you know, maybe we should end on something else, you know, hopefully. One question, one more question going for $10. Yeah. Does anybody have a great, <laughs> yeah. great story about how their lives were made better by building on top of a cloud instead of in the old way? Uh, no, you, you asked yours. Let me see if uh, anybody else. Anybody else? Questions? No? He's going to get the mic again. Watch out. <laughs> yeah, all right. Yeah, I'm just, if you can. Shout it out. Open, yeah. uh, OpenStack versus uh, vCenter, let's say. Do you see customers replacing? It's an addition to what they have. How do they manage both environments together? Are you, are you asking this question from a developer perspective or more from a... I'm a, a, I'm a software vendor. I'm a vendor, so a prospective vendor. So how, how, how do I foster an ecosystem, something like that? What or? do you see customers doing? Okay, so a lot of customers already have vCenter ESX deployed, okay? You have OpenStack. What are they doing? New applications, new deployments, new server rooms. Are they working in, in, together or just separate applications? Any experience there? I'm asking a question for for me. Who wants to take that? I'll give, I'll I'll give, a, very, I'll give a very short answer. I think most of the new applications are going to a cloud platform, and I think uh, the migration of quote legacy applications into a virtualized environment are targeted to vCenter. So I think we're going to see both existing very, for quite a while, because I think they serve two very different different application sets. Yeah, and then I think that there's certain application of OpenStack in some of the cases we've seen where they already have vCenter and they want to be able to sort of start nibbling away at that environment in the context of OpenStack, have OpenStack do the management, right, as opposed to vCenter. Um, and so they want that integration. And whether or not they then branch out from there and also adopt KVM or Zen or whatever, you know, different story. But, you know, they start by saying, I've already got this. I want to take advantage of that, all right? And I want to be able to use, I want to be able to use OpenStack to manage it. Okay. Do you guys want to add anything or? Okay. How about we do a closing remark or are we done? What do you think? Okay. I see that it's done. All right. Um, so uh, I really want to thank all of you for, um, you know, for asking the thought-provoking questions. Uh, I really want to thank the panel. You know, I know they had a very busy day, very busy week, uh, and they are here. Uh, you know, just, just seek them out. 
Uh, I'll put up their Twitter IDs as well. You know, it's right in the first slide. So feel free to hit them up on Twitter. Okay, or if you find them anywhere, you know, just talk to them. Okay, uh, enjoy the summit. And uh, again, thank you all for coming, and uh, thank the panel again. Thank you. Thank you.